again, and thanks for joining us here with Washington State Parks. My name is Alyssa, and I'd like to welcome you back to the second part of our three-part mini-series as we explore the eruptive process of Mount St. Helens. And of course, I'd like to reintroduce you to our helpers. We have park visitor Leah. I'm so excited to be here. And we've got Mount St. Helens. In our last video, part one, we learned all about the buildup to the 1980 eruption. We created a series of dance moves to help us remember the events that played out. Let's go ahead and recap to help you remember. During the eruption buildup, we had earthquakes, harmonic tremors, phreatic eruptions, and the bulge. Today, we're going to do part two of our three-part mini-series and learn all about the 1980 eruption. All right, here we go. After prolonged activity, scientists realized an eruption was imminent and inevitable, so they prepared for the worst. They monitored the mountain around the clock, taking calculations, measurements, and observations. Soon, all discoveries pointed to the same conclusion. Mount St. Helens was going to blow. By mid-May, evacuation of the local residents had already occurred, and zones of safety had been designated around the mountain. Without a special permit, recreation was off limits. The beloved natural paradise around Mount St. Helens, generally abuzz with activity, was calm and quiet, as it had been emptied of recreators. The forests, Spirit Lake, trails, and viewpoints were officially closed. The area was covered in a thin layer of ash, and the mountain was stained gray and black from numerous small eruptions. The morning of May 18th, 1980 was calm and peaceful with blue skies above. Folks remember it as a period of silence before the violence. But then all of a sudden it happened. At 8.32 in the morning, the mountain began to stir. And soon this turned in to a full scale volcanic eruption. Let's go ahead and learn how this story played out. And remember, we're doing it through dance. When Mount St. Helens finally erupted in a really big way, it was a multi-step process, but it all started with an earthquake. The largest earthquake the mountain had experienced so far, magnitude 5.2 on the Richter scale, and it shook that mountain. Let's go ahead and put a dance move to it. Here we go. The biggest earthquake so far. Now you give it a try. Well, after that earthquake hit, it triggered the largest landslide in recorded history, removing the entire north flank of Mount St. Helens in a matter of seconds. That colossal debris avalanche ripped down the side of the mountain, hit a ridge line, and slammed into Spirit Lake. The water was emptied out and sloshed right back in again. But the landslide didn't stop there. It kept on going all the way through the other side. Well, let's go ahead and put a dance move to the landslide. Here we go. From a ridge line, down it went, over, up, and over, and out. Once again, up from the mountain, down it went, over, under, over, and out. Now, you can give it a try. Hmm. I don't know if you know this, but volcanoes are hot. Yeah, like really hot. In fact, they can melt glaciers, snow, and ice. And that's exactly what happened at Mount St. Helens. That heat triggered a flash flood and that material went down the mountain, mixed with a landslide, and turned into a volcanic mud flow. We call that a lahar. And that lahar went very far. It's like a whirling, swirling vortex of chocolate milk gone horribly wrong. And this mud flow went down the path of least resistance down the North and South Fork Toodle River, the Cowlitz River, and all the way out to the Columbia River. Let's go ahead and put a dance move to the Lahar. Here we go. Now remember, from the mountain, down it went all the way out to the other rivers. Once again, from the mountain, down it went all the way out to the rivers. All right, now you can give it a try. Now, during that eruption, something else happened called a pyroclastic flow. That's a superheated stone wind. Yeah, I'm literally talking about flying rocks. Now this one, called pumice, look at that rock, flew up and out of the mountain. 
Well, at Sidekick here, Mr. Breadcrust Bomb was very heavy and it knocked over the trees. Well, let's go ahead and put a dance move to the pyroclastic flow. Here we go. The pressure from within was released. The pressure from within was released out of the mountain. Now it's your turn to give it a try. Now, a big part of the eruption story is the ash, and it made a big appearance on May 18th. This fine material was ejected up and out of the mountain in a 15 mile tall ash plume. Take a look at that. Now remember, what goes up eventually comes back down again. And when it settled across the landscape, it became quite a mess. Let's go ahead and put a dance move to the ash. Here we go. Now remember, up and out and down it sprinkled. Again, up and out and down it fell. All right, now it's your turn to give it a try. Wow, what a process. Let's go ahead and string all of our dance moves together so we can better understand the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Here we go. The first thing that happened was a colossal earthquake, followed by a debris avalanche or a landslide. Then that triggered a flash flood and a mud flow, the lahar. And then we had a pyroclastic flow of superheated stone, followed by the ash cloud rising upwards and sprinkling down around the community. Wow, now it's your turn to give it a try. Well, I hope that through this dance, you have a better understanding of what happened when Mount St. Helens erupted. Once the ash finally settled, it became clear that Mount St. Helens had undergone a massive transformation and it was almost unrecognizable. Here's what it looked like before the eruption in the good old days of the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. And after the eruption, that's what we were left with, a barren moonscape, practically desolate, as if nothing could have survived. And when we look at these photos side by side, it's even more impressive. Well, after the eruption, the scientists returned to the area to see what was left of Mount St. Helens, and they continued to monitor and research it as they once did before it blew. The biologists among them started to make predictions. What had happened to the plant and animal communities? Well, what do you think? Do you think anything survived the volcanic eruption? And if so, how? Well, let's find out. I invite you to join us for the third and final film in our three-part mini-series as we explore the eruptive process of Mount St. Helens. Our final video talks all about the transformation of the landscape. Well, thanks as always for joining us and we'll see you next time. Um, I'll be right back. I gotta go check on the trees real quick. Yeah.